So welcome everyone back. Uh, thanks for everyone who come back. Uh, uh, spinal theme again, and we have um, Ramesh um, who will talk to us about um, Codec Wina. Uh, over to you, Ramesh. Hi guys. Um, so. Right, so I'm try, trying to keep it as brief as I can. Um, so these days I have to, we have to give a disclosure. Uh, that's my disclosure. So what's, what's the Cora Equina syndrome? I think uh, this is the key take home message today. This particular uh, paper, I think it's, it's, it's from the bus. It's freely available on Google. If you click Bath syndrome, you'll get this document. It's two pages, it's pretty comprehensive, very self-explanatory. Just make sure you go through this one. And there's one by, I think, Jeremy Fairbank uh, about Coraikonis syndrome. So there's two things that you need to read uh, before the exam. Uh, you'll see in the back side. So according to the bus, any patient with uh, acute back pain and or leg pain, and with any suggestion of their bladder or bowel function disturbance, and or saddle anesthesia or saddle, you know, sensation, sensory disturbance should be suspected. Basically, any referral that you get with query, you know, waterworks or bowel problems from your GP or from your AME, do take it seriously. Like Atar mentioned, um, it does cost a lot if you missed one. Uh, so, this is the more sort of traditional definition by Fraser, which is quite readily accepted. Basically, uh, one or more of the following must be present to qualify as Cordaicona syndrome. Should have bowel or bladder, and or bladder, reduced sensation in the saddle area, sexual dysfunction with possible neurologic deficit in the lower limb. I think the last one is more to do with spinal surgeons, but as a, as a newly qualified orthopedic surgeon, you don't need to worry about the sexual dysfunction. But if they complain about it, do take it seriously. So it's a big spectrum. It can be anybody and everybody that comes through the doors as query So there's a there's a sort of a, a differentiation in in uh, the the presentation. Somebody who's very early or suspected quadricona is someone who's recently who's had long term unilateral uh, leg pain. They have progressed to bilateral leg pain. They are they are the potential people who can develop. And um, incomplete quadriquina, CSI, is someone who uh, has associated sphincter disturbance with the urinary or bowel, or both. Retention is when you have clearly missed the bus. Uh, retention and is usually painless. So uh, there is a progression of 1% in, in all the uh, you know, deterioration, rather not progression, deterioration in function of bladder and bowel, 1% every hour. So if you delay your treatment for an established or, or for a person who has Kodaikwana, they have progressed from CESI to CSR. A quarter of the patients will do that. So this is a, a good paper if you want to read through. Uh, it's quite famous and frequently quoted about Kodaikwana. Someone with bilateral sciatica, bilateral lower limb uh, paresthesia, weakness in both the legs, perineal pain or paresthesia, and altered bowel or bladder function. Uh, these are the patients who qualify for scan. So we do keep talking about uh, uh, PR, direct rectal. Every time there is a referral, you ask your any colleague or your GP, have we done a PR? Um, there is, the rectal examination does not predict or does not uh, tell you whether the patient has got Kodaikwana or not. But it is medical legally very important, and that's why we do it. So what is more um, uh, important is the perineal paresthesia. There are enough papers talking about these things. The perineal paresthesia or sensory loss or sensory disturbance is more important than the rectal examination. So if you look at the BAS paper, you treat MRI as a triad service. Basically, you uh, separate the wheat from the chaff. Uh, 
you do if you get a if you're in a DGH and get a cortical referral, it's your duty in DGH to do the scan before you refer the patient across the, the spinal center. Um, so, what is the how how many positive uh, scans you have? You have about fourteen to fifteen to thirty percent of them, and of the of all the referrals, there are only about maximum seven percent of patients who end up having a decompression. So it's very low yield. But previous uh, thought process that if you don't decompress uh, the cortical immediately, but you do it within forty eight hours, there is no uh, change in the outcomes. It's very important that you do it very early. As it progresses one person per hour, if you do it at 24 hours, they're likely to, to retain their bowel and bladder function and even sexual function. But if you delay it up to 48 hours, you don't recover as much. Beyond 48 hours, uh, clearly uh, there is no recovery at all. But if you're not referring to the spinal surgeon or if you're not decompressing it, for whatever reason, you document that. Documentation is very important, especially in the spine world. That's it. So the things that I did not include in this, so you could have, I could have talked about diagrams of a, a cross section of spinal cord, various incomplete spinal cord syndromes. But I'm sure all these things that's something you will read about yourself, and it's all about practice of diagrams and uh, knowing the the various cord syndromes. But I'm sure we will touch upon that in the in the viva section or hot seat session later on. Yeah. Okay. I'm take more than Yeah. So Ramesh is right. The court, the court syndromes is going to come up on your basic science uh, table very quickly. Draw 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 a cross section of the court, and then explain why each of these uh, court injuries have their symptoms. Um, so we can cover that as a separate topic later on if need be. If it doesn't come up in hot seats. Yeah. So this could acquire a topic is important. Thanks, Ramesh, for covering that. Uh, it's one of those um, never to miss, really. If you miss it, I think it'll be impossible to come back uh, from it. Um, and as Ramesh said, the most important thing is to recognize the impending uh, incomplete coda equina. That's really the stage when you can make a difference to the patient and prevent further progression into complete. Because once um, it goes into complete coda equina, um, first of all, I mean, no one will miss called complete code equina. It's a difficult uh, one to diagnose is the incomplete one. Um, secondly, obviously, the prognosis is, most, is, is quite poor with the complete. So if an examiner says anything about um, any sim patient has any symptoms of irritable bladder, poor stream, any diminished abnormal sensation, straight away raise the alarm of code equina and scan the patient immediately. Uh, if they tell you when to scan, wait the next morning, and uh, things like that, insist that you want to do the scan as soon as possible. You will not go wrong with that. Uh, any comments from um, Athar? Um, no, I think about uh, Corda Equina. I think Corda Equina, as yes, everyone has to have a definition. So, so my my two pens for everything in the exam is need to know the controversy need to know the buzzwords. So, so the controversy here is when to operate. The buzzword is the definition and the, and the need for MRI scan. So any, as this paper suggests and, and Ramesh tell us, you know, the, this, every, any suspicion, keep high index of suspicion, yeah. have the scan, even if you don't think it is, and, um, and then deal with it respond to check with the neurosurgical unit over here do remember referring patients to neurosurgical unit because you are in a dgh Definitely. and you have a, uh, i think i think we have this uh, guideline as well the uh, um, boa guideline yeah there are boa um, uh, there is a british association of spine surgeon guidelines okay. about um, standards of care for established and suspected coda equina syndrome. And if you start quoting this in the exam, uh, that will be to give you extra marks. Uh, there are other papers um, um, also published. Um, there is a cohort study published from Lister uh, in the European Spine Journal that talks about the duration of symptoms prior to surgery and how it influences the outcome. Um, 
I can also share that paper with the group uh, later on, like uh, Shwan did earlier. If I just add one thing about uh, the influence, now that's a new thinking. There may not be papers to quote it, but people are going away from the timing now. The timing they are saying is not as important yes. as the in insult to the to the codec when initially. So the degree of codec when I per se. Yeah. So if it's very very bad, the yeah. outcome is bad irrespective. Exactly. Of yeah, I think I, I would I would advise that don't talk about timing at all. Yes. If the examiner asks about timings, as far as you're concerned, patient needs Im immediate emergent MRI scan and, Im and immediate discussion with the spinal unit. Uh, and don't say anything much more than that. If the so, examiner starts talking this, about timing, uh, you, you say you want things to be done immediately, but you can always, if you know any evidence, uh, there is evidence as Athar says about, you know, issues with timing and 12, 24, 48 hours um, and so on. So there's a couple of things to say about timing. Uh, as Faraz said, uh, if you're going to be asked in the exam table, uh, remember you're being judged according to a standard uh, DGH consultant who uh, recognizes no You do not take the decision yourself about timing. Uh, you must say, I will talk to the spine people, but more importantly, when they got me to talk about timing, uh, they said, what would you like to do for yourself? My response was, if it was me, I'd want uh, surgery straight away, and that's what I would want for my patient. Uh, Thank you. So that's, uh, the, that's the attitude you should take with your patients. Always advocate for them, okay? In the yeah. Especially in the exam, but in real life, of course. Um, the second uh, thing to say, Kodakwina, there is also um, some evidence that uh, residual postvoidance is one of the most uh, sensitive in terms of picking up uh, patients that need mandatory scanning. Um, so my attitude to this is my personal attitude to this and <coughs> what I would have said in the exam if I was brought up this topic uh, if they asked me about how what's sensitive or not um, I find PR to be very insensitive it's variation between patients mm -hmm. I use peri perianal wink as a, a good sign and I catheterize the patient uh, after the patient avoided and after I've got my ultrasound scan. So first uh, ask the patient to void, then do a, re a residual volume uh, bladder scan. The residual blood, uh, if it's greater than 200 to 250, this patient needs an MRI scan and you can then confirm uh, that the patient might be, uh, might be quadruplinar by catheterizing the patient after that and uh, tug on the catheter if they feel it. Uh, it might not be caught up by now, but if they don't feel it, that just confirms what you're going to, you're, you need your MRI scan urgently. So someone is asking the question about uh, what is the degree of cortic vena compression. I have a picture for it as well. I'll show it to you, but by degree means is like displacement of distal radius fracture. So the outcome is the degree of displacement. No, so it's, it's the same sort of thing that how much of the cortic vena is compressed because it then subsequent compressed the blood flow within the cortic vena and then give irreversible damage to the nerves irrespective to the timing because once the blood flow is completely occluded then we are looking at for a neural tissue whatever it's 30 minutes i guess or a brain tissue before the irreversible damage happens, it's 30 minutes, I think. I don't know, I, I, I have no idea, but if, 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 if blood compromise, if a vessels compromise, I have a picture in my one, I can share it, uh, that picture. If the vessel compromise, then the dura dies. Yeah. There was a question from about one of the participants about the importance of the catheter tug, which is that, you know, a technique we use to help us in the diagnosis. And I feel there's no one single test that will confirm or ex exclude. It's a syndrome and there will be a um, you know, wide range of um, symptoms and signs to pick up. So I would not definitely rely on one sign. I don't know what uh, other mentors think. 
I think it's a perfectly right answer. Uh, my, our clinical lead, which is again, a big spine unit, he always talks about five things. So he say perianal sensation, perianal tone, anal contraction, anal wink, and bilateral symptoms. So four things on the um, PR, including the anal wink with the pin prick, which is more important. And it cannot be subjective because you know, if you use all the rest, you know, you can have loose anal tone by various other reasons. 